Every morning at the Monastic Academy, we chant the five precepts. These are uh, not to kill, not to steal, not to commit sexual misconduct, uh, more or less like, uh, like rape, incest, and so on. Um, uh, not to lie and not to consume intoxicants. Um, these are, in a way, very simple. Um, they're seen as sort of like the, the minimum ethical threshold. Uh, uh, everyone, in order to be some kind of a good person, needs to be maintaining this degree of ethics, this degree of morality, etc. Um, There are a number of different perspectives that different teachers offer on the five precepts. Um, and I'll speak mostly to uh, the perspective that Sori Foral, our head teacher, uh, gives. And then I'll speak some about uh, my own perspective. Uh, and in particular, I want to talk about the fourth precept against lying um, or against false speech. Uh, There's a way both to, to how they're phrased and uh, uh, I guess their sort of simplicity, sparseness, uh, that one might think that these are easy to uh, uphold. So in fact, the way that they're phrased, uh, uh, it's translated as something like, I undertake the practice to abstain from killing. I undertake the practice to abstain from stealing, and so on. Uh, 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 so that alone might make it seem much easier. Um, uh, it's, uh, I've seen it expressed by contemporary teachers and uh, in the Pali Canon, the oldest uh, 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 Buddhist textual tradition that is still maintained, um, uh, you know, oh, well, if you mess up, you should feel bad, you should feel ashamed, but, you know, you just sort of keep going, you're not going to burn in hell or whatever for having made a mistake, um, or only for having made a mistake, and, like, that it's irre irreparable and so on. Um, uh, so that kind of adds to this perception of them being easy, uh, and you might think, okay, well, you know, I don't really, I don't, I don't like, okay, killing, well, okay, I have to start, I'll have to stop killing bugs. This is sort of difficult, but I don't, I don't like kick dogs in the head or, you know, I don't like steal things from people's houses. This should be pretty straightforward. I don't rape anyone. I don't like lie to anyone's face. This is, I'll be fine. Okay. I have to, okay, alcohol. This one is difficult for people, uh, especially in the West, but uh, for uh, my impression is that uh, Buddhist practitioners in the West who try to take the five precepts might see them as, you know, a commitment, but not some like extraordinary privation. Uh, okay, so Soryu says this is quite wrong and uh, really the five precepts are essentially impossible. Uh, so we could start with the first one against killing. So you might say, okay, fine, I'll, I won't kill bugs. Uh, uh, I already don't kill dogs. I definitely don't kill people. I'm done, right? Uh, and so this is not sufficient. Immediately you go like, okay, well, what about food, right? Fine, uh, I, won't, I won't eat meat because I'm incentivizing someone to the... the, the the butcher to kill the animal. Okay, I won't eat meat. Ah, well, what about eggs? Because okay, fine, I'll be a vegan. Even if you want to be a vegan, immediately you run into trouble. Because what about all the animals that are killed in the process of uh, uh, harvesting uh, food for industrial agriculture? Like, I don't know, off the top of my head, something like two million wild birds are killed in Spain each year in the olive oil 
in olive oil production. Okay, great. So already for, for the one that would seem pretty straightforward, uh, we're just sort of, we're screwed. Uh, it may have been possible, it probably was possible at the time of the historical Buddha uh, to actually practice this. Uh, uh, it would have been still actually pretty difficult uh, doing agriculture in a way that doesn't destroy, uh, that doesn't kill even like, like animals uh, or bugs is quite difficult. Uh, we can leave aside like oh, do we count plants as living creatures or whatever? Even if we don't count them as living creatures, still would have been quite difficult to do at the time of the Buddha, Extra extraordinarily difficult to do now, even if you make your entire life about it. And if you try to live as like a normal person and you like, you're like, still, okay, I'm gonna be vegan, and you buy chickpeas at the store, you've already lost. And, and basically all, all the rest of the five precepts are like this, maybe with the exception of the third precept against sexual misconduct. So sort of you has said, uh, uh, the third precept is actually probably the only one that you can pull off where you can just say, okay, well, just won't have sex with anyone ever under any circumstances. Great, done. Uh, so that works. Uh, that doesn't help you with the other four. Um, uh, this alone should be reason enough for doubt. Uh, doubt meaning something like sincere, honest, like reflection and concern, maybe dismay shame, etc. Uh, horror, perhaps. Uh, so what I've said alone should be reason for doubt, but I want to speak on uh, the fourth precept in particular, um, uh, the precept against lying. Um, I'll actually quote from the Buddha. So this is from the Mus Musavada Sutta, the sutra, the discourse on lying. Uh, this was said by the Lord, bhikkhus, monks, I say that for an individual who transgresses in one thing, there is no evil deed whatsoever he would not do. What is that one thing? It is this bhikkhus, deliberately telling a lie. There is no evil that cannot be done by a person who deliberately lies, who transgresses in one thing, taking no account of the next world. Uh, so there's a, there's a way that you could interpret that, uh, that allows a lot of kind of laziness on the part of a practitioner, um, So you might, you might take the perspective, oh, well, I don't like lie to someone's face. I don't look someone in the eye and simply say something that I know is false to deceive them. I'm fine. I, I'm not, I'm not like the, sure, whatever. I, I'll believe the Buddha or not. Uh, if you do believe the Buddha, or at least believe uh, this textual tradition, uh, you know, I, it's fine. I, I'm not, this is like not, this doesn't affect me. Uh, okay, so we end up with trouble. What's a lie? What does it mean deliberately telling a lie? Um, there's, a kind of, there's a kind of minimalist perspective on this. So the perspective that some teachers take is like, okay, uh, it's actually not such a big deal to even buy meat because in fact, some traditions take this, um, entire schools. Uh, it's not such a big deal, d d big deal to buy meat. That's somebody else's karma. You know, the butcher, even if you're incentivizing him to, to cook, to, to slaughter the animal, and like you know that he's gonna slaughter the animal and you saw it or something, uh, it's fine. Okay, I don't wanna be too uh, dismissive. It's, it's not like uh, these traditions are like this sloppy about it, but nonetheless, uh, uh, as I understand, there are traditions that say it is fine to buy meat, no, even knowing that it was killed by a butcher, uh, even incentivizing its killing, that's on them. Okay, so this is a kind of minimalist perspective and there's a, I suppose, maximalist perspective where you have to take responsibility for all of the consequences 
at least consequences that you're aware of of your actions. Uh, and this is the direction in which Sori leans. Uh, so if we, if we go in the same direction of, okay, well, am I concerned about the, uh, the, the death of birds in Spain because of the olive oil that I'm cooking with, uh, we can then start to ask like, okay, what actually is a lie? Um, this is a good question. Uh, I'm not going to claim to have solved this question. And indeed, like the way that I've set this up, I'm not claiming uh, any kind of absolutist perspective. Uh, but I want to present uh, what, I think, I, what I think is a very useful uh, uh, orientation, at least to, to practice with sometimes. Um, uh, so I'll quote someone writing, who then quotes Robin Hanson. Uh, Robin Hanson is an economist, statistician, uh, one time AI researcher. Uh, so the, the person, first person writing. Uh, we often talk as though the existence of uncertainty and disagreement make beliefs a mere matter of taste. We say, that's just my opinion, or you're entitled to your opinion, as though the assertions of science and math existed on higher and different plane from beliefs that are merely private or subjective. To which economist Robin Hanson has responded, you are never entitled to your opinion, ever. You're not even entitled to I don't know. You are entitled to your desires and sometimes to your choices. You might own a choice, and if you care and if you can choose your preferences, you may have the right to do so. But your beliefs are not about you. Your beliefs are about the world. Your beliefs should be your best available estimate of the way things are. Anything else is a lie. Uh, he goes on. But never forget that on any estimate about the way things are or should be, and in any information situation, information situation meaning like any kind of like state of uncertainty, any state of limited information about something, uh, uh, there is always a best estimate. You are only entitled to your best honest effort to find that best en estimate. Anything else is a lie. Okay, so this is quite an aggressive perspective. Uh, again, I don't uh, mean to present this as the absolute truth. Uh, I don't hold this perspective most of the time myself, but um, I'd like to keep it in mind and work from there. So, Starting from uh, the Buddha says, uh, anyone who tells a lie is, uh, 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 would do anything, would, is completely untrustworthy. And taking this perspective of Robin Hanson's, anything but your best estimate at something is a lie. Um, I'll give some sort of like motivating examples. So, um, Maybe, maybe make that, that uh, assemblage seem richer or more real. Uh, so uh, most of us, I'd say, start out with a kind of messy situation with respect to the accuracy of our beliefs. Uh, it actually presents a lot of problems. It's like, okay, well, you know, what do you do given that you kind of already seem to believe a lot of things that aren't true, but you can't even reconcile the whole system and things are sort of sneaky, hidden assumptions in all kinds of places and actually they're affecting even like your ability to do cognition. And Okay, this is quite a mess. Um, uh, uh, but I'll start from the assumption, hmm, okay, 
Well, what, what, what if you started out relatively sane? Uh, what if you started out, um, you know, basically having an accurate picture of the world to the extent that you're aware of it? There are things you don't know, there are things you know that you don't know, but fine. Um, even then, uh, you have to maintain this kind of like strict mindfulness, strict discipline with respect to how you allow beliefs to enter into your mind. Okay, so why is this? Um, Without going into the details of the, of the theory, um, kind of an, an, an intuitive, intuitive gesture. Um, let's say someone comes to you and they say something surprising. They have some you know, surprising, unreasonable seeming claim about the world. Um, uh, and you're like, maybe you actually want it to be true. It would, it would make some things better. Okay, already you're in trouble. If you're, if you're wanting something to be true and trying to determine if it's true at the same time, it gets you into a lot of trouble, but okay, fine. So you, you want the thing to be true, but you're trying to, uh, trying to remain sort of sane and then you know, down the line to be able to speak truthfully. This is, in terms of the precepts, we're considering speaking truthfully, not speaking falsely. Um, As the person speaking to you suggests pieces of evidence, oh well, okay, this thing happened and this person told me this thing and I saw this and consider this sort of hypothetical and so on. Uh, uh, each piece of evidence is a kind of uh, weight on a scale. Uh, and there are many other weights in the other direction and there's a large space of possibilities. Uh, each piece, each, each argument, each consideration is a weight on this scale. Uh, and uh, our correct estimation of the probability of this claim is, uh, stands on the accurate or at least truthful assessment of the weight of each piece of evidence. So, if when we when we put the put the each argument onto our mental scale, we kind of like uh, make it a little bit heavier. We like add add some extra coins of uh, veracity internally to it. Um, it 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 makes the 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 scales lopsided. And you might think, ah, well, I, I, I add a couple of stones or something in, in this metaphor we can imagine, like, you know, uh, comparing uh, weights, of, weights of coins or something. I've added a couple of stones unfairly to one side, but it, it's just a little bit here. It's not so bad. Some, some of my beliefs are a bit lopsided, but it's basically fine. You know, I, I, it's, it's basically functional. It's not too bad. We end up in a lot more trouble because our beliefs are actually made of like many sub beliefs. So um, I think that this thing is true and I believe so whether or not I actually know that or not. But my belief implicitly rests on the assumption that this thing is true and this thing is true and this thing is true and they have some relationships between them and so on. And so some lopsidedness down here trickles up and then also affects the rest of the system, affects the rest of your uh, belief network, we might say. Um, uh, furthermore, uh, one problematic belief can, perhaps this is not that likely for any, any given belief, but especially central ones, especially important ones, especially ones that are uh, fundamental to your ability to orient to the world and to see the world clearly, uh, can have uh, uh, effects that reach really all of your ability to uh, believe true things, to notice the world and, and come to true beliefs about it. 
Uh, and then down the line, of course, since we're speaking in a Buddhist frame, uh, to be able to speak truthfully in this, at least speaking about the, the, the five precepts. Um, so, uh, This gets us in some trouble. Um, if, we, if we take what the Buddha says, you know, someone who is willing to lie uh, uh, will do anything else. Uh, maybe we can interpret that given, given what Robin Hansen said is like, all, including someone who's willing to deceive themselves. Uh, if we say someone who's willing to deceive themselves uh, will do anything. Uh, well, you know, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter if I beat this person. It doesn't matter if I kill this person. This actually isn't really a person, you see, right? Uh, this is like, I don't know. Maybe about as important as a dog. Okay, I, I don't know. Us, us uh, modern Westerners would be offended at beating a dog, but nonetheless, this is a thing that people have said. Uh, uh. This is kind of like where where the rubber meets the road. So. If we want to keep the five precepts, uh, if we want to live a like minimally ethical life in Buddhist terms, um, we have to be willing to sacrifice a lot of our desires, right? So uh, uh, I'm angry and it's nothing to, uh, uh, to kill this bug or I want to eat meat because, I don't know, meat tastes good and I feel better when I eat it, or uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to take this thing from someone who doesn't know and I it, not really, you know, whatever, or I'm, uh, I'm going to take part in a global economic system that is unjust. Uh, uh, regardless of how, how uh, how minimalist or maximalist you are in your interpretation of the precepts, in any case, we have to uh, be willing to sacrifice some of what we want uh, in exchange, if you want to say it that way, in order uh, to behave ethically. Uh, and in particular, in order to be able to speak truthfully, and then really, as the Buddha says, in order to be able to, be able to to be able to be ethical at all, because if you can't speak truthfully, you're willing to do anything. Um, we have to maintain a discipline of mind uh, that yokes itself to the truth, which binds itself to truthfulness and accuracy and sobriety. Um, and along with that is being, being willing to have things not go our way, being willing to let go of wanting a certain thing to be true. Uh, just this kind of clinging, uh, grippiness, needing, ne neediness, and the suffering, uh, concomitant with it, uh, that wants to distort even just your own perspective of the world to make a thing true, to add a few stones to the, the scale, to your mental uh, scales of truth, um, 
can come to warp one's entire mind. I'll say one last thing about this. So this, uh, uh, this, this kind of orientation, uh, I think, runs into a lot of problems, right? Uh, this runs into, into problems even a, in a sort of like ordinary secular context. It's very difficult to live in this way. It's very difficult to maintain this kind of discipline. But uh, uh, since we're speaking about Buddhism, uh, right, we have to be concerned, okay, what does this kind of discipline mean in a spiritual context? Okay, great. So, you know, there are a lot of spiritual teachers, there are a lot of traditions, they say a lot of uh, at least surprising things or things that should be surprising, right? Okay, uh, you are reborn and you've lived uh, uh, countless lives, I, I don't know, trillions quadrillions, I, 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 I don't even know enough Buddhist cosmology to give you like the order of magnitude. Uh, every being that you meet has been your mother and your father and your daughter and so on, right? So this should be surprising. Uh, this is a claim that is made by the Buddha. Uh, uh, there are... Um, Similarly, surprising claims made in uh, all over world spiritual traditions. Uh, and I think one ought to ask, okay, well, what do I do with this, right? Uh, I'll, I'll, just speaking from my own experience, uh, uh, you know, even if, even if rebirth is true, it's going to be kind of hard to, to uh, uh, substantiate, right? Like it, 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 you have to, so the tradition says anyway, uh, you have to actually reach a pretty high level of practice to be able to uh, come to the direct knowledge of, of your own uh, rebirth, right? Um, and uh, for me, this was and still is in many ways concerning. Uh, uh, Buddhist teachers might seem uh, very exceedingly sane, kind of obscenely sane, like obnoxiously reasonable all over the place. And then they say, okay, well, they, oh, God, what this rebirth thing? I mean, it might, oh man, I don't know what to do about that. Sure doesn't seem true from where I'm sitting, but I suppose I could like imagine information that might convince me otherwise. Um, uh, In my experience, there are a lot of people uh, uh, who come to, well, I'm speaking about Westerners naturally. Uh, there are Westerners in America around my age who come to Buddhism, uh, find it uh, affirms things that they've noticed about the world or uh, seems to have some truth to it, and then kind of like take it on wholesale. Um, uh, it would be easy, it would be very pleasant and comfortable to simply believe the whole thing all in one gulp <laughs> and, then, and then run with it from there. Uh, and I think this is irresponsible. I mean, this is inappropriate. Uh, I think this is perhaps unethical. Um, And I'll share a perspective which I think is viable. Uh, so Tani Sarabhiku, who's a, a contemporary Buddhist teacher, very conservative in terms of his perspective with respect to the tradition that he comes from, um, uh, and in many ways quite radical relative to uh, uh, modern world culture, um, uh, explains it this way. Uh, He says, the right move is something like, or at least the, the move that he uh, recommends that uh, 
students of Buddhism make is something like, okay, well, there are these teachers, and they seem to be saying a bunch of things that are reasonable, and they're also saying this thing about rebirth and karma, and perhaps I won't take it all on wholesale, but I will take it on as a working hypothesis. Uh, see what happens if I work from there. Um, uh, uh, say, I won't believe this exclusively irrevocably, but I will work with it, and I will, uh, as the Buddha said, come and see. I will, like, mm, take it seriously, try to, uh, s try to practice it, try to, uh, see what fruits that perspective bears. Uh, and I think this is a, this is a much more, uh, 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 a much more uh, sober approach than the one that uh, I've seen uh, many people my age anyway take in uh, spiritual contexts.